G'day pals, welcome back to a new video. On today's Insignia Dev update, I wanted to talk about uh, why the game doesn't yet have a Steam page. Uh, this is something that I answer pretty often on my stream on weekdays, you should catch me online on Twitch, uh, where basically people come in and say, oh, you know, this is a great looking project, where can I wishlist it? And um, at the moment, my answer is like, you can't yet. Some people would say that this is kind of like lost opportunity, like the more wishlists, the better. Um, but I like to think of it a little bit differently and uh, I wanted to talk about that today. So let's get into it. So on the road to Steam, basically, this is something that, of course, I, I'm looking to have the game have a Steam presence and a, a, a marketing presence, which is kind of more broadly what this is about before the game's release. And uh, the way that I like to think about these things is that, you know, when it comes time to sell the game, I want to know what it is that I'm selling. And you might ask, like, how is that possible that I don't know what I'm selling? Like, obviously, I should know if the game's so far along, you know, shouldn't you be able to say, well, it's an action adventure game. It's a platformer. It has side scrolling combat. Uh, what more is there? But I think it's, it's really important to be able to isolate like what it is specifically that you're selling when you're selling a product that is in a market that has competition. So today we're going to be talking about what I've been doing in the last month or so and kind of why this stuff comes before a Steam page. So the first thing that I want to do is kind of show you guys um, just like the Steam kind of page for the adventure game category, um, particularly at the bottom here, the pixel art adventure games. So not all of these are action adventure, some of them are more RPG, but I think the, the point remains. Um, it's really important for all of these games that they explain themselves in their marketing in a way that accurately communicates the best aspects of what makes their game special. Part of this is color choice, part of it is fonts, it's logos, it's, it's what art to be using. So, you know, It Takes Two is a really good example of a game that's very well marketed as far as the logo has the two characters in it. It Takes Two to Tango as a reference to the title kind of brings us back to relationships as well. And, you know, we see that it's an action game. We can see that the characters are doing dramatic things. And, you know, we're getting a little bit of a hint into the world of the game as well, right? We're seeing that the characters are really kind of like small scale relative to what's around them. There's also, you know, questions about the colors that are being chosen. It's got quite a, kind of like a warm palette or at least a palette that allows the characters to shine a little bit more but the lighting is still dramatic. Uh, the backlighting kind of gives us this kind of like grandness to what we're seeing here. So just looking at this, you know, thumbnail here and the gameplay, right, following that gives us a really, really quick, clear idea about what kind of game this is and what we should get excited about as the potential players, right? Getting that right is really important. A lot of these games will be to some extent similar from a kind of cursory, you know, back of the envelope description. If I click, you know, action adventure games that have pixel art graphics, and we kind of like, just look at them, like Rusted Moss here is a game that I've seen uh, on uh, Twitter, and uh, it looks really great. And when we look at like specific gameplay aspects from like a really abstract kind of like bird's eye view, it doesn't look that different to my game, right? We've got a character, we've got action combat, side scrolling, platforming, but there are obviously major differences that make this worth your time or, uh, you know, that you might be interested in that need to be communicated about this game before we have the conversation about, you know, picking this game over a different game or whatever, right? That's what marketing's job is. It's to tell you like, this is the game for you based on what kind of game it is, right? And so when I come back to Insignia, this is the question that I've been answering in the last kind of like six months since October last year about not just like what is Insignia as like a back of the envelope description and what are the features that it has as a side scrolling action adventure game with, you know, melee combat and platforming. That's one thing, but among games that meet that criteria that already fit that description, what makes Insignia unique? I've in the past kind of really resented the idea of a unique selling point when it comes to games, particularly when people say like, what does your game do differently? But in the last six months, it's been something that I've actually understood a little bit differently. I've kind of arrived at this concept of uniqueness uh, in a way that's different to, I guess, the way that most people think about like unique selling points. I've actually had a really difficult time articulating this using vocabulary that we normally use when talking about games. And so here's an example from a game uh, that I think does the thing I'm talking about really, really well. So Final Fantasy VII has this system, device, mechanic thing, called Materia. 
okay? And Materia runs through the entire game. I actually asked ChatGPT to kind of like explain this. Maybe like it would have some like knowledge that we could distill from this. So I asked the question like, what role does Materia play mechanically and in the world? Try and describe the importance of Materia and its cross-sectional identity between both functions of the game and the story and or world context. Basically to summarize what ChatGPT says here, you know, Materia is a magical orb in the game. You can equip it onto weapons and armor and it gives you special abilities and access to spells. Right, you can level them up, it, it's part of the gameplay. But in the context of the story, Materia represents kind of like these crystallized essences of the Earth's life force. And uh, the main antagonists, the Shinra Company and Sephiroth are kind of like using and commandeering this force to kind of, you know, assert their dominance over the citizens of the, of the planet. And so from like a really abstract, broad, you know, thematic understanding all the way down to the moment to moment gameplay, Materia kind of finds its way in all of these things. So what I love is this part here. Through its dual role as a game mechanic and narrative device, Materia is a fundamental aspect of the Final Fantasy VII franchise and one of its core iconic features. So there are three words here, right? Mechanic, device, and feature. These are, I think, trying to reach the crux of what it is I'm talking about, uh, which relates to the game's identity. So my thesis statement here is that, yes, I think to market a game successfully, it does need to be unique. But the source of that uniqueness doesn't necessarily come from just the mechanics. It doesn't have to have unique mechanics because I don't have any plans for Insignia when it releases to do anything that no other game has ever done mechanically. Mechanically, yeah, it's like an action game, right? But what is it about its identity that is unique? This is what I've been, you know, chasing. So it's really important when I'm marketing Insignia that I can take those aspects of its identity and trickle them through the marketing such that you as the player or the potential player, when you're looking at those materials, can recognize the kinds of things that I'm trying to uh, invoke and evoke in you, okay? Now this has of course consumed me in the last couple of months and the games that I play and observe as they release is something that I'm aware of and I think games like Hades do a really good job of kind of like explaining themselves through their marketing. You know there are aspects here that are really really clear that go all the way down to color choices that kind of sell what it is that the game is about in its totality even in single images like this. Right, so we can look at, at the marketing material. We can say, okay, look, we've got this theatrical pose here that Zagreus is in uh, with gameplay elements. So weapons, we're looking at the uh, cast. We can see aspects of ancient Greek uh, architecture and elements in his design for the character all there, right? We can see this relationship to the gods, but we can also see kind of very slight references to the kind of elemental relationship with the gods that the game has. Across the whole game, there are these kind of like rainbow reflections that feel very luxurious, right? On the edges of everything as like specular highlights. And each of those colors is kind of like reflecting kind of like specific gods. Even in the design of the Hydra itself, actually, as a boss fight, there are times where it changes its appearance and the moveset changes based on uh, which colors that it's taking on. And those relate to the gods that those colors are associated with. And even in other things like in the opening cutscene, you can see aspects of the game are being communicated to you kind of like just by virtue of like visual communication. So, you know, the relationship with ancient Greek architecture tells us that we're in ancient Greece. The skulls tell us we're in the underworld, right? There's death around. The laurels reinforce that kind of like godly Greek statue thing. It's not just Greek, but specifically Olympus, right? And the Greek gods. We see the rubies here. So there's there's going to be some sort of treasure, um, but maybe at a price, right? That the, the relationship with treasure and death tells us a lot. And then generally speaking, uh, the infernal aspects of flames and embers. This is something that is communicated to us in very subtle visual things, right? This game, Hades, knows exactly what it is. Right. And so from the, from the first trailer, from the first screenshot to the gameplay, watching Hades in motion leaves no doubt as to what kind of experience you're going to have as the player. You can see the design intent, those core values propagating all the way through 
I kind of just want to talk about kind of like what I've been doing in that regard. So to set this up, bit of a long time getting here, but in the last month I've been working on a bunch of different things about the game. This is uh, like a colored version of my Git repository. So these are the uh, commits that I've made in the last month. Um, keep in mind, not everything is part of the game's code. So when it comes to design or art, I don't always, you know, commit those changes. And so this is mostly to do with code and systems that I'm working on. So breaking these down, a lot of work in what I call the Ensign ability system. This is kind of like my version of materia in the game, my way of explaining the game's kind of like core themes and mechanics and devices all down into one kind of moniker, one word. And that is to me, I call it Ensigns. So Ensigns are effectively single use power-ups that you extract from enemies that relate to the elemental uh, kind of foundation of the game. Uh, and so I've been working in kind of like all of the work that I'd done previously on abilities and um, behaviors that the player can do, as well as enemies, and kind of refactoring them into this system and the code that relates to that. Some highlights here are things like the slide and dive kick, which are really cool moves you can do. Uh, a lot of these have platforming implications and I've been working really hard to sort of design abilities that are powerful in combat, but also can be used to solve platforming puzzles and can have enemies that impart those abilities that themselves use them, which is kind of like a pretty layered concept, but uh, it's coming along really well. Another huge part of this is the VFX. So I was talking about Hades earlier and how it kind of uses color to represent the gods. This is very similar to what I'm doing in Insignia where I have four elements and the abilities in the game map to those elements. Anytime that those elements are kind of expressed in the game, when you are facing an enemy that's using a specific element that you need to counter, when you unlock an ability that has a specific element, when there's any kind of time where I need to communicate that you need to use a specific element, that all echoes back to uh, the kind of like VFX, UX, UI design of Ensigns. Loosely speaking, these are, you know, very similar to your like earth, air, fire, water elements, green, red, blue, yellow. And in the last month, I spent a lot of time building a system that would let me kind of like instantiate particles of each of the elements wherever I need them to be, whether that's trailing an enemy or following an enemy's hit slash attack or um, on an object that's kind of like being absorbed into the player, like collectibles and stuff. All of these things can have these VFX kind of applied to them, which increases the flexibility for me, allows me to prototype faster and allows me to keep a consistent look and feel across the game. So what you're looking at now are clips from the stream. I'm obviously doing voiceover right now. Um, this is me kind of looking at the uh, abilities that I've been designing and deciding that, you know, I need to be able to communicate these visually in the game to create more usable and intuitive feedback for the player. Now in Insignia, the way that you gain access to your special abilities is by countering enemies doing abilities of that type. So here I'm trying to kind of like describe the earth uh, ability and the VFX that I'm using or wanting to use to sort of describe enemy abilities and things in the scene that would give you uh, an earth based ability. So I'm doing some mock-ups first. And then I started like concepting in Leonardo, just like what I would expect this to look like. The player character is a blacksmith. And so I had this idea that maybe I'll use fire and kind of like sparks with each of the elements. So here I'm kind of exploring this like green ghostly kind of fire that would be the earth element. It's kind of hard to, to get in the headspace of, but that's what I started with. And eventually I happened on this idea of like, maybe the fire is kind of like dissipating into like leaves. I also did variations for the other elements. So this is like fire and water and some really quick rough kind of mock-ups of like what I would expect enemies using these abilities to look like, like what I would expect the, the VFX particles to be like doing in the scene. So here we've got like an outline with some like particle effects and stuff and like this smear that's coming from the attack animation. 
So here the idea is if you meet the criteria to kind of like extract an ability from an enemy, there'd be like an explosion of particles with some like sparks and like blacksmithy, uh, you know, VFX, and then kind of like a trail that leaves behind, in this case, like grass and leaves, because it's an earth ability, with the ensign, that's what this little gem thing is, kind of like trailing out and getting absorbed back into the player. So then I started working on it. Basically, this was like, let's just create a particle system that does the thing. One of my criteria here was to make sure that all of my VFX in my game feel like they go together. And the way that I do that is through shaders. So you can see here that I'm trying to do some clever shading stuff to kind of reduce this particle system that's, you know, very noisy and alpha based down to something that's more uh, quantized and pixelated. And that gives it more of a kind of like hand-drawn look. So towards the end of day one, I had like a particle system that I could move around. It was made of like squares. And what I wanted to try to do next was to create like an animated leaf, like by hand, that the particles would kind of like devolve into each. And at first this looked like really crappy. Like <laughs> I just didn't look like what I wanted it to look like. I, it just wasn't right. And I kind of like at first dismissed this idea altogether. So the bulk of this technique relies on what's called a render texture. And what I have here is like a camera that's looking at the particle system that's kind of offset on the Z-axis from the rest of the game's content. So only this camera can see this particle system. And then later I'm shading the output texture and putting that on a quad that the main camera can then see in the scene. I actually did have another go at doing the, you know, hand-drawn particles. Uh, and actually it, it came together a lot better the second time. Here you can see kind of like what I'm working with. Um, you can see that particles look like pixel art now. Although the visual communication, we're kind of looking at it looks kind of like poison, like leafy poison. And by the end of the day, you know, I had a few variations. You could see it slowly progressing. On day three, I started trying to do a little bit more to soften the effect, but it still creates a lot of weird additive noise. And it was something that I was really getting kind of uh, annoyed about was how additive and noisy the effect was looking. Um, you could see here kind of like an example of what was going on. Like it's not so far off from what we were originally designing, but I really wasn't too happy with just kind of like how little control I had over the shape of what I was looking at. So I came up with this like harebrained idea to basically take the properties of the particles that I wanted and mask them in different ways using different channels in the shader. So rather than using alpha for alpha and um, you know not being able to capture the age of a particle or anything like that, what I would do is use color, red, green and blue, those channels as the different properties that I wanted. So like one particle system, but have some particles take away and some particles add to the system. Here you can see I'm using blue and red uh, as well as brightness to determine the difference between a cutaway particle, which is blue, and a flame particle, which is red. You can isolate red from purple. So, you know, red particles on top of blue particles can still have their value, but blue particles on top of red will actually cut them out. And it took me like the rest of the day to figure this out, but I actually got it working really, really well. I was isolating the cutaway particles from the additive particles and changing the value based on whether I wanted more or less weight on age versus like um, opacity. And you can see here that effect in, in motion. So the blue particles get completely eliminated, but they obscure red particles behind them, which allows me to create like plumes of flame. Uh, that have that cutaway. And here's kind of like the working example. You can see it's got those lovely shapes um, coming off the back of it. The next step was like, how do I take that effect and actually make it map procedurally? Because I don't want to hand draw these, obviously, right? I, I made a particle system. How do I make it follow the curve and the contour of an enemy attack? And uh, luckily, I write my own animator called Retrobox. I actually have a curve system in the animator. Here you can see there's an enemy attack and that's the curve that I want to map. And I have the ability to sort of like change the frames over time on these curves, as well as the positions. So then the task was to kind of like use the curves to actually model over time the position of a particle system, as well as the logic for like when the effect should appear and disappear and doing object pooling on the effects as well. So before long, I had the system working exactly how I wanted it, which is pretty cool in the end. Having like the ability to just like add a click of a button give an elemental affiliation to an enemy ability that wasn't designed that way. You know, I could just say, oh, this is going to be a red ability, make it spawn flames when the enemy attacks, was really, really cool. I was really impressed 
with how close I was able to match the effect when I drew it to the actual sprite. And of course, the added bonus to this was that I could map this to anything. Um, I'm still not like 100% happy with it. Of course, like it's a little noisy and I want to do a better job of showing the hitboxes and the smears. That's something that I can do, I think, inside of the enemy attack frames from the animations. I spent a long time then trying to do like the next effect, which would be like the, the earth effect. Um, doing like vines and bits and pieces, but that was really, really difficult to get right. And uh, in the end, I kind of just like opted out of it and went for something a bit simpler. You can see here, I'm working with this idea of like just spawning leaves behind the player uh, when they use the ability. In the end, I was pretty happy with that too. I think as a compromise, like it, it looks good. So that was like a whole week of last month where I was doing VFX and trying to like get one step closer to getting my game in a state where I could sort of like express to players what it is that's happening visually, elementally, kind of like story-wise, lore-wise, in combat uh, regarding these elements. From there, I did some enemy designs uh, and you can see some examples of them here. Uh, I worked on this kind of concept for, I guess like, it looks like Torterra from like Pokemon, uh, but it, it looked like a bunch of different things over its little life cycle. Uh, where it's like an enemy that you can wall jump off of, which I thought would be really cool. Uh, and I also worked on this badger. It's kind of like a similar concept. It's it it has like a block a blockade as a shield that you can't pass through. So one of its moves is like a shockwave, and that shockwave, if you uh, capture it, lets you jump like much higher. So I did some really quick roughs of this guy and animated him uh, so that I could put him in the game and prototype the ability. You can kind of see here the concept at play. Uh, basically, you know, stabbing down at the thing and then you get the green ability which lets you bounce over him and then you can kind of do whatever you want and attack him from behind. So as I explained in the VFX section, I did a lot of uh, updates to Retrobox, which is my animator, to get those curves working and also to streamline the actual architecture of it um, in preparation for maybe a public release sometime in the near future. One of my uh, regular viewers on stream is a programmer and has agreed to kind of like explore with me the option of um, them kind of taking it over and us kind of like splitting the profits as they develop it for uh, consumer use. It's not something that I'm able to maintain because I'm working on my game obviously but if somebody else wanted to work on it you know I thought that would be a, a reasonable way of actually like distributing stuff like this. And that includes another tool that I work on called Scene Graph. Scene Graph is my like editor for managing like the world map basically. And um, it's something that I get asked about all the time when I'm working on my stream. And so maybe in the future, it will be worth um, having someone help me kind of like distribute that as well. So what I worked on was mostly just like adding grouping, giving it a new kind of like color style and um, just making some of the bugs that uh, have been in there since the beginning uh, a little more ironed out so that I can use it more freely. You can see here the grouping system and the minimap is actually working and I can actually you know cluster some scenes together and give them a name. And finally the last thing I did which was like yesterday was uh, actually come up with uh, a little extended feature on um, some camera behavior stuff that I've been working on. So what we're looking at here is effectively some strategy to lock the bounds of the camera so that when you get to the end of a level like on the x axis whether it's like the beginning or the end that the camera won't like pan over into the content that's not there like having it actually stop as you approach the edge of the level i want to do this in like a procedural way because i've got hundreds of scenes and i don't want to manually place these bounds and i also want those bounds to be not just where the doors are but in like certain extents so there are examples where like you can't go any further left here so the camera should stop here and not extend into this area. So I'm going to try that starting uh, Monday. That was my end of February and start of March. To come back to our original question about what all of this has to do with the Steam page and the identity of the game. The combat without the VFX for the particle system, it just looks like a combat system. With the particles and the VFX when it's working as it should, and I've still got a bunch of UI design and UX design and motion graphic stuff to kind of like round that feature out. Like right now you're seeing elements, but they're not the end signs that I've been designing. So 
there are actual like symbols that go along with each of the moves that help you differentiate between say two different grass type moves or two different fire type moves. So without all that stuff, anything that I distribute about the game isn't gonna be really representative. Now I can already hear you saying, but Adam, this is all kind of like gravy. Why don't you just put something out and then you can update it later or you know just let us wishlist the game and we can we can figure something out um maybe that's true maybe i should just put a dummy page up or something like that but i've been burnt in the past in that area so putting logos or uploading demos on youtube that are old that stuff still circulates today and makes the game look worse today because it's not representative of the game that i've got like a little bit of a timeline here that i'm working on it's not a timeline but it's a line of an order of things that I want to get done, kind of like a Gantt chart. What I'm talking about here is that synthesis of features. When the game's identity is really like, you know, humming along and everything's like perfectly in sync from a foundational perspective. So not the content of the game being finished, but just the systems of the game um, and in a state that's presentable. That's when I'll feel more comfortable doing that marketing, um, having conversations with publishers, building a team, doing some sort of Kickstarter, because at that point, I know what I'm making and I can dictate and delegate what that looks like and how that should feel to others. And there are examples you know, in the game where people can say, oh, how should this feel? How should this work? And I can say, you know, it already works this way. So let's expand on that. So what we've been looking at in uh, February and March is kind of still in this, in this area, uh, kind of moving into this area. I actually want to be pushing a little bit more um, late game enemy tests with abilities. So enemies that have multiple abilities that you have to steal specific abilities from to solve puzzles that maybe have different solutions and lead you down different dungeon pathways depending on what you do in the combat. And then finally doing some kind of like prototype quest that demonstrates all of these in like a game loop. So I already have a demo of the game that you can play. It's been available since 2020 and that contains you know, a bunch of story content and the first chapter of the game in terms of quests and combat and just tutorializing the, the onboarding of the game. But this would be something a little deeper, maybe like a cut from like three or four hours in or something like that, where I'm really flexing what the game is capable of when all of the systems are firing. It's very hard to kind of showcase uh, late game progression with a demo that's the start of the game, obviously. You don't want to show the player or expose the player to all of the mechanics and all of the systems in the first 10 to 15 minutes. So for me to feel comfortable, like proceeding with like the next phase of development and like getting this game released, I need to be able to, to say for certain, like I've got something fun and I know what the end of the game feels like when you're playing it. That's kind of like where this started, this little journey in October. So that's my February and my March. Uh, I hope this wasn't too over the top. I hope I didn't give you a dump of information. I probably could do these once every two weeks and split them in half. Um, maybe I will split this video in half. Um, you can, you'll find out if I did a part one and part two. But I hope this kind of like inspires some confidence from you in lieu of a Steam page that I am working very actively on the game as I have been for like five years and that it's something that you can get excited about watching me make. If not, get excited about its release, which might be coming later in the future. I'd love for you to come and watch me make the game, which I do weekdays on Twitch. Uh, you can catch me at twitch.tv slash Adam C. Uh, the links are always in the description and you can catch my schedule there on the page. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the uh, devlog for February and March. I'll catch you in the next one.